Hi guys, my name is Gamerish Belly, the host for Back to Basics, another Back to Basics, another week. Hope you're enjoying all the episodes so far, and it's just so exciting that the season is almost over, but we still have yet to record more and more and great more. So today's episode, we are going to be talking about thriller, uh, crime, books, authors. Well, we'll figure that out when we get into the episode. But there's one thing that I do know what we have on this uh, episode, and we have an author. His name is John Mann, John David Mann. And I want to make sure that he is welcomed. And John, thank you for coming on Back to Basics. It's my pleasure. I'm so, so glad to be here. It took us a while to, to connect it all happened, but we made it happen. Yeah, absolutely. It took us, uh, what is it, a couple of months just to get here, and finally we made it. So thank you again, to, uh, John, for coming here. Excellent. So before we get into the details of your book and your maybe so-called sequel also, or even prequel, if there is a prequel, what does Back to Basic mean to you? Uh, you know, it's funny. It means things on, 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 on different levels. You know, there's sort of the life level and then there's also the writing level. Mm -hmm. I'll just start on the writing level because for me, writing so often turns out to be a, a beautiful metaphor for living. The challenges a writer faces are a lot like the challenge challenges that a, a human being faces. Writing a story, crafting an arc of a story that's satisfying and fulfilling and has meaning and is rich is a lot like carving out a life. It's a lot like living a life. Sure. Um, so in writing, you know, it, people often ask about writer's block. You know, have you ever heard about writer's block? I don't get writer's block exactly, but I get stuck. I get I get into a corner. I, I, I get in a place where it's 5.30 in the morning. I'm sitting in my chair. The sun isn't up yet. This is where I do my best writing. And I'm sitting there, and I've written into a corner. I have no idea what to do. Hmm. There's a chapter that is stuck. It's just not working. It's dead on the page. It just feels lifeless. I can't make the character come to life. I can't make the dialogue work. It just... I feel like I'm whipping it. It's not, yeah, it's not yeah, there. Yeah. And I try all my tricks. I, you know, I try everything that every, every technique I know, and nothing's really quite working. And what I've learned, I have to. James Patterson, the, the best selling writer, he says he never gets writer's block because his answer is whenever he feels stuck, he just goes and does more research. You know, his research always turns up interesting things. Yeah. And that's kind of like in life when you feel like, your life is stuck. Absolutely. You're in a situation you can't figure out. You know, James Patterson might say, well, go out and do something. Sure. <laughs> go out and do something different. Take sure. a car trip. You know, go shopping. Do, do something. Actually help a person. For me, when I get stuck like that, what I've learned is I have to sit back and put the, the problem out of my mind. Forget about this chapter. Forget about this situation. And say, what's this story about? What's going on? What's the big picture of the story? Mm. And that to me, you know, that's probably happened in my life more than a hundred times where I've been in a crisis point mm. and I've been trying to figure out the crisis mm. and it, it fights back. It won't be figured out. Mm. And I have to take a deep breath and step back and say, what, you know, not to sound too cliche here, but why am I here? Like, what What is my life about? What, yeah. am I, what are my highest values? What am I trying to do in my life? What matters? What's important? Hmm. And for me, that that always solves the story problem, by the way. Because when I go back and I, and I, and I see, oh, I have never actually identified what this character wants in the whole story, where they're going. And when I do that in this big picture way, I zoom back in on the chapter and it starts to write itself. The, the problem is just vanished. Mm. That to me is going back to basics. It's like, for me, basics is the big picture. What matters? Yeah, thank you so much, John, for, the, for that. And again, thank you for coming to Back to Basics. Uh, uh, definitely honored, uh, for sure. So, John, for how many years have you been doing uh, writing and creating this this masterpiece that you have? You know, it's, it's been a kind of a funny path. It's been a 
I describe it as a pinball machine sometimes because, okay. uh, and I guess I'm a little steel ball. <laughs> I don't know who's running the flippers. Um, because it isn't like I sat down at the age of 23 and said, I'm going to be a writer. Uh, that did not happen. I I kind of careered through a, a variety of paths, a number of occupations and, and pursuits. But whatever I was doing, I was in nutrition, I was in education, I was in, in uh, retail um, and marketing. Whatever I was doing, I always seemed to be the guy who would write the newsletter or write the article or edit the thing. Mm. Um, my, my, my parents were both academics. My mom was an English teacher and a playwright. My dad was a musicologist and a college professor. So the writing was kind of in my blood. In your blood, right. But not fiction. I mean, that was, well, my mom was a playwright, so that's fiction. Um, but but it's, it's, it's not something I studied in school. Uh, I didn't train for but it just kind of kept drawing me. I started out as an editor. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I did professional editing in some business journals, actually. Mm -hmm. Journals that I started or that I co-founded. Mm -hmm. And then I was editing other people's stuff for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And that kind of edged into ghostwriting for people. I bump, would bump into people who had a great story to tell but didn't have the, the writing skills. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, be their, I'd be their pen hand sure. and write the book. And then that merged, that came into co-writing, where I was really co-authoring a book with people. Mm. Uh, this is all nonfiction, and I kind of always wanted to try my hand at fiction. So Steel Fear, the novel that you're talking about, the thriller, mm. is my first novel. Mm. It's my first venture in, in fiction, and it's, it's really been decades, decades coming. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Eric, for that. So when you create a book... Is it the same feeling from the first book till today's date? Yeah, it, surprisingly, it is. I mean, it, mostly. It, of course, it's changed. It has to change somewhat, sure, right? Sure. Um, but it's surprisingly similar. So, for example, I'll sit down. I, I wrote a, uh, I co-authored a series with my friend Bob Berg called The Go Giver. Mm -hmm. and it was one of the first books I did. That was it was a it was success. It was a first my first big success in, in writing and. Um, we just sold over uh, just past the million copy mark this year. Yeah. So the Go Giver, um, which I wrote with Bob, came out. Publisher asked for a, a sequel, and then another. And we've done now four Go Giver books. And they've all done very well. Last year, I sat down to write first time to write a book with my wife. Mm. We've never co-authored a book together. Uh, she's my best friend. She's my constant companion. She's my best reader. Not only because she's my best champion, she applauds everything, she loves everything I do, but she's also really critical. She's also very, got an acute critical eye. So I listen to what she says, because she'll say, this part doesn't work for me. Sure. Um, and that's, I always pay attention to that. So I love her for that. Um, but we've never written together. It was time. We sat down to write the next Go-Giver book. Mm. The Go-Giver Marriage, it's called. Mm. It's coming out uh, next spring. So. I sat down with this, and I was writing the first part of the book. And about three weeks in, I tell you, Gersh, I was sitting in my chair going, oh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. This is not working. This is not going to work. And, of course, there's this voice in my head saying, John, you've done these before. <laughs> you published over 30 books. You've done four Go-Giver books. They all worked okay. Mm -hmm. This is going to work out okay. Mm -hmm. I knew that objectively, but it was still like, well, yeah, but I don't think this one's going to work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. think this story works. So there, there's still that sense of newness, both in the sense that it's challenge, mm -hmm. and also in the sense of the excitement of it. Sure. Um, it's just as I mean, I sat down to do the sequel to to Steel Fear, and it was terrifying because Steel Fear was really well received, and it's like, how do you top that? Can I possibly? You know, I could never do that again. Can I measure up to that? Um, and it can't be like a retread of the same story. Of course. You never tell the same story twice. Twice, right. So it's always a challenge. It's always new. In that sense, yeah, it's just the same now as it was, you know, time I first typed the first few words in the first book. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So let's, let's go to basics, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Do you 
do you write uh, the book with the character in mind or does the character come later? And the second part is, do you write the book and then get the title or the title ah. starts first? Yeah. Let me start with the, let me start with the title because that's easy. Okay. Um, because it varies depending on the book. Sure. There have been books where the title came first. Okay. And there had been books where the book was long done and still nobody had, had any idea what to call it. Mm -hmm. um, Steel Fear, the title was there before I ever, before I even, you know, started anything. Go, the Go-Giver, when Bob Berg came to me and said, I have this idea for a book, it's called The Go-Giver. So he had a title before I was even on, on the scene. On the scene, right. Um, yeah, the same was Steel Fear. Brandon, my, my Navy SEAL sniper friend, uh, former Navy SEAL sniper, Brandon Webb, he's my co-author. This is an idea he had loosely based on an experience he had while he was in the Navy on this ship you see over my head, the mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln, USS Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. aircraft carrier. Um, so Brandon had an idea, and he had a title, and he brought that to me, and boom, so there it was. But the character question you asked, and of course there is the other side where there are books that we actually published one book. Bob and I published the second parable in the Go-Giver series, and we, we gave it a title. Actually, I think our publisher chose the title, to be honest. Okay. He said, this book is called It's Not About You. And the whole idea was that, you know, don't think everything is about you. About you. Think about other people. So anyway, sure. this, it came out, it was called It's Not About You, and nobody bought it. <laughs> okay. I think everybody looked at the book and said, that's not about me. I might as well not buy it. Sure. So it was terrible in marketing so, sense. In the marketing sense, because it backfires, right? It backfired. And it performed very poorly. The oh. book just did not get read. And so a few years into it, we went back to the publisher and said, you know what? We think we, we, mis we mistitled this. We think we mispackaged it. It's got the wrong cover, the wrong title. It should be a go-giver book. And it should be. It should. It should look like a go giver book. It should look like the first book. It should. It's not the same story, but it's in that same spirit. Mm. And so we retitled it. We called it the Go Giver Leader, and it's done really well mm. since then. We didn't mm. change the inside. We changed mm. the concept. Mm. Uh, so uh, we changed the inside a tiny bit to fit the title. But so there's a case where not only did we not have a title but when we did get a title it was the wrong title <laughs> we had to get the next title a few years later uh, so all extremes there in the title question sure. the character questions to me really interesting um and i'll use steel fear as an example but it's applied actually I'll use any book as an example i usually start with some characters i always start with some characters i, I know who my my kind of my hero or my central character is male or female, um, and I may have a few other characters, but I don't really know who they are yet. Mm. And there are teachers who say, before you start a novel, you should spend months writing notes about the character until you know the character as well as you know your brother, mm. as well as you know yourself. Mm. And I admire that idea, and I tr have tried to do that, but I can't, because I just I don't know who the person is yet until I see them in operation. And sometimes, most times, maybe all times, when I'm working on a book, character will surprise me. A character starts to show dimensions I didn't know they had. Um, I, I get to know the character better and better. And sometimes I'll have to go back to earlier in the book and, and rewrite things because I know more about them. And I know that they would never have done, done it that way. They would have done it this way. Sure. Um, so if in a way, you know, as you, the reader, are reading the book, you're getting to know these characters. Well, the same thing is happening for me. As I'm writing the book, I'm also getting to know the character. I don't write from beginning to end. Sure. I write from beginning to end, but back to the middle, to the end, back to the beginning, to the middle, back and forth. And I, I think, just to go back to the metaphor, I think that it's, yeah, that's, for me, what my life has been like, kind of getting to know more about myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm not really the person I thought I was when I was 20 years old. Sure. Of course. Uh, you know, this, there's this wonderful scene in the Shawshank Redemption, mm -hmm. which everyone knows, mm -hmm. where Morgan Freeman is talking to the parole board mm -hmm. uh, about, you know, how he, he, uh, he looks back on himself, that stupid kid who committed that terrible crime. Does I want to talk to him? 
I'm going to tell them how things are, mm. but I can't. Yeah. That kid's long gone, and this old band is all that's left. When you're writing a story, you can go back <laughs> yes. to that character yes. you know, when you're 19 or 20, and you can because you it's your universe. And I, I think it's you know in our minds we're constantly discovering more about ourselves, and that's that's how it is with characters in a book. So basically, the way you're explaining is that you you take an onion and you start peeling in different different layers, and you yes. slowly understand who that person is, female or male, it doesn't really matter. Am I right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's. I can really, you know, I used to hear movie actors talk about the process of getting to know the character that they're portraying, you know, sure. whether it's Rami Malek playing, uh, you know, Freddie Mercury or, or Meryl Streep playing Margaret Thatcher or whoever it is. Mm. And sort of the process of learning more about them and learning about them and learning more about them so they can step into their shoes. That's exactly what it feels like as an author is, is you don't write a character as much as you learn about them and then step into their shoes and say, and sort of start to act out in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Thank you so much, uh, John, for that two part question again, if you don't mind. So the two part question is the book, becomes a, a movie okay mm -hmm. sometimes the movie doesn't do justice because the book is so much better let me give you an example from my point of view uh that's just my point of view only uh the movie misery i felt the m book was a lot better than the movie ah. itself that is just one example so do you think that there are certain layers are they can't explain uh when yeah. it comes to movies versus a book that's the first. Completely. That's the first oh, yeah. question. And the second part is: Do you feel do we need to do movies or do we need to do TV series? Because you can dissect the whole entire story in a eight-hour movie versus a, a, an hour and a half. That's really a, a perceptive question. It's when we started. When we were, I'll take the second part first. When we were pitching Steel Fear to Hollywood, we had several conversations we had several people we were in conversation with mm -hmm. uh and and some of them wanted to turn it into a movie some of them wanted to turn it into a tv series mm -hmm. and um one guy who wanted to turn it he said i could go with feature film or series limited series either way i could we could do this either way he said but i would lean toward limited series because of exactly what you said Gary. she said uh, I think that there's there's too much in this book to unwrap. Sure. I don't think we can do it in two hours. Sure. I think that I think there's enough there. There's enough with the characters. There's enough with the plot and all the subplots. There's enough with the mystery, the whodunit part, uh, uh, and, and the aircraft carrier, the environment itself. Just uh, there's really enough for for an a eight-hour miniseries or a ten-hour miniseries. So that's the guy we went with. It's in development now. It's we'll see what happens. Um, it, when I say in development, that means the studio has not yet greenlit it. It's not yet shooting. Mm. It's still in the writing process. So we don't know yet for sure whether it'll end up on people's screens, but it's, you know, it's going in that direction. The first part of your question, uh, yeah, there, it, it's, you know, it's the age old uh, dilemma for, for authors when their books are made into movies. Um, you know, the cliche is that the movie's never as good as the book. I think that's not true. I think that sometimes the movie is as good as the book. It's mm. just different. Mm. When the movie is as good as the book, and it's, it really is comparing apples and oranges, right. because there's such different experiences. Yes. A book is immersive. You know, a book, you spend time with the book. You're in your chair with the book, whether you're reading it on pages or on your pad or whatever. And so, you know, you bring a lot you, you you picture the scene in your head. You hear the voices in your head. And also the author has time to unroll. Mm. The author can get inside characters' heads on, on the page. Mm. He, he, the only way you can do that in the movie is with a voiceover, which you, you can only use a voiceover so much. So much, it's right. A pretty, it's a pretty hackneyed technique, and it gets, it gets tiresome really fast. It, and so movie is a visual medium. Mm. It's very, very different. Yeah. You you can't translate a book into a movie without radically transforming it in the process. 
usually you lose a lot of the content. You have to. But I'll give you a great example, and that's uh, Cider House Rules hmm. by John Irving. Now, John Irving wrote the book and wrote the screenplay, and he won an Oscar for the screenplay. And in my mind, they both really work. The book is phenomenal, but John Irving writes these, like, huge epic style books he writes like a 19th century author like mm. he's you know dickens or god knows who you know it's like ah! and the idea of putting that in the screen is of course impossible yeah but he did he what he did the, the, the book takes place over 33 years cider house rules the movie takes place over three years mm. yeah another another interesting example the movie three days of the condor Mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, Robert Redford, people yes. might remember that. Yes. The book was, I think, was called uh, Seven Days of the Condor. Mm -hmm. So there you go, <laughs> from seven to, to three. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to turn a book into a movie, you are guaranteed to lose a lot in service of a movie, and it isn't usually that successful. But I think it is, I think, yeah, examples where it is, I really appreciate. Funny, Misery, which you gave the example, you know, Stephen King wrote this amazing book. The screenplay was by um, Bill Goldman, William Goldman. That's right. Who wrote uh, All the King's Men, uh, uh, All the President's Men, yes, yes, Butch yes, Cassidy, yes. and yeah, so on, yeah. Princess Bride. And uh, yeah, it was really a crazy, crazy, crazy challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So now, now the uh, the the question that I have is, you have a character in mind, you have a story in mind, and you don't want to change whatever it's in the book. But when yeah. it comes to a movie or a TV series, there might be some director that might be saying, "We need to dissect this and change this a little." Now, yeah. does the author play a role into this? saying that, you know what, you're ruining my image because this is my book. Does that make sense? Or do you say, Look, let it go and let them do it? Yeah, it, it totally makes sense. And 99.999% .9 of the time, no, you have absolutely no say. Jim Patterson tells this great story about being on the set of the first Alex Cross movie. And uh, Morgan Freeman, he comes up again. Morgan Freeman is, you know, Alex Cross, and he's having a blast. He's sitting in the studio watching them, watching the dailies or whatever. The, and... Uh, he says, and, Alec, and uh, Morgan Freeman's in his house, and, or he's in a house, he's talking to some woman, and uh, Patterson turns to the director and says, who the heck is that woman? And the guy goes, oh, it's, uh, it's Alex Cross's sister. And Patterson goes, oh, oh, okay. Alex Cross has a sister? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I love that moment because, like, this is his book. <laughs> he doesn't know what's going on. Um, you know, there are horror stories of movies uh, that, that that veer so far away from the book that they're almost like caricatures and that, and that the author hates them. Stephen King hated the first uh, uh, Shining, mm. you know, Stanley Kubrick. Uh, the Running Man, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Chris Schwarzenegger is about as opposite of the main character in the book mm. as you could possibly imagine it's like mm. a joke that movie compared mm. to the book mm. um so it, it's it's uh i've never had a book made into a movie so far so i don't I haven't had the experience but from everything i've read and heard authors more typically find it to be a horrifying experience than a, than a, a happy one mm. but there are there are uh there are exceptions for mm. sure you know mm. for neil gaiman was was on the set of um uh, what's that lovely movie uh stardust Stardust, right. And uh, such a sweet book. And there's an example. They did a lovely job with that movie. It misses so much of the book, but the movie's lovely, and the book is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite books. And, you know, Neil Gaiman was, he's a total gentleman, but he, he just loved it. Or Lee Child loved the first Jack Reacher movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it does happen where authors can be very, very happy. Do they have input on what happens? Uh-uh. Nope. Yeah. nope. It's the director's job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that. So... The Steel Fear is more of a thriller, am I right? Yes. When yes. it comes to thriller, is everyone a suspect? Yeah, yes. Everyone is a suspect, even the hero. <laughs> even the hero, okay, okay. In this so, case, in Steel Fear, it's not giving away too much to say that Finn has some slight memory issues. Okay. Uh, so it becomes credible question is like, could he have done this? So yeah, it, 
Everybody's nobody's off the table. Nobody's off the table. Okay, awesome. Including the author, I'm pretty sure. Yes, that's right. I could have done it. It's possible. <laughs> yeah, thank <laughs> you so much for that. So now you have never had a book which has become a, a movie. Do you think that you want the book to be a movie, or do you think we just want to be content and have just a book? Uh, it's funny. The the Steel Fear I would really like to see on the screen. I think it's really screen friendly. I think it would would make a, a a really good limited series. If that happens, I'll be excited about that. I think it could be done as a feature film, and it could be great. Um, I just, but anyway, uh, uh, but but not every book. Um, even though this is my first novel, I've written uh, uh, quite a few parables, half a dozen or maybe eight, I'm not sure I'm counted, but and a parable, at least the ones I write, a parable is a story. I mean, it's kind of a didactic story. You write it to teach certain points, and at a certain point along the way in the book, they're usually like there's the three rules or the five laws or the ten principles. So it has kind of a a, a educational teaching quality to it which is a non-fiction thing it's yeah. kind of like it's a lecture right but it's a story yeah. and it has to work first as a story if it doesn't work as a story then nothing else matters mm. so for me when i'm writing a parable the 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 point of the story the moral so to speak is secondary the story has to come first so all the parables i've written i mean i think they're all good stories they all work as stories the go-giver has been optioned three times Mm. Uh, this is by people who have wanted to turn it into a feature film, a TV show, whatever. And, and no one's done it yet. It hasn't happened. We, we, the option's gone, reverted back to the authors. That's us sure. every time so far. I, I have toyed with the idea, and I still do, of writing a script myself because I've done some screenwriting, mm. and I think it would be fun to do. But I think that may be a book that's best left as, as a book. I think there are books that are best left as a book. Sue Grafton, who wrote the Alphabet series, mm. her her hero is Kinsey Milholm, female mm -hmm. private mm -hmm. eye, just a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful character. And she wrote A is for Alibi and B is for, and all the way up through Y. Mm. And she died before she wrote, she could finish Z. Mm. Um, but she wrote 25 of them. She said that she told her children that um, she never optioned her books for for, for movies. Uh, for our TV, and she told her children that after she died and she was long gone, if they chose to sell the rights to her books to Hollywood, she would come back and haunt them. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want them made into movies. Of course. She said, I would prefer that Kinsey Milhone live in their readers' minds. So, yeah, yeah. so there's that. I always think about that. Think carefully before you, you get what you wish for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how much longer do we have for, for the sequel to to come in? Or is this a sequel prequel? <laughs> so this, is, this is an actual... You know, it's 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 funny. It's a sequel, although it has a, a little bit of prequel to it, in a sense. Mm. Um, there the, There's still some unanswered questions at the end of Steel Fear. Mm. You know, the identity of the killer is revealed. Mm -hmm. If it weren't, all the readers would come and kill me. Sure. Um... But uh, but there are questions about the hero and about his past and about, that, that are that are unresolved, and those are picked up in the second book, which is called Cold Fear. Hmm. And I I just finished the manuscript for Cold Fear. It's done, so I know what happens. Uh, and it is a sequel. It happens a few months after Steel Fear. It happens in Iceland. The whole thing takes place in Reykjavik. Um, but it's it, it's it's. I'm, I'm thinking it'll come out next summer. We don't actually have a pub date yet. My mm -hmm. guess is it'll come out next summer. Mm -hmm. um, there will be a prequel at some point because uh, a lot of the story of Finn, the hero, has to do with events of his childhood mm. that he dimly remembers or doesn't remember or is trying to remember. Mm. So at some point, we'll we'll have to take a trip back there into his past. Yeah, yeah, That's going to yeah. be fun. That's, I hope so. I hope so. Uh, definitely. So, John, now you have done so much. And you have written a book almost to be a TV series slash movie, depending on whatever the the cards play. Right. What are you doing for the next five more years? And this is after when you've done your sequel. Yes. Uh, I'm writing. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, and, and my 
my writing has always been a little bit schizophrenic in the sense that I always have several things going on and they're, they're very different. Mm. So I have this series of books, the Goalgiver books, which are these sweet little stories that are kind of about lovely, noble principles about giving and about being a spirit of generosity and about leadership and about, um, you know, being successful in the world by being somebody who puts other people's interests first and and thereby creating great reputation hmm. and you know what, what Stephen Covey calls a moral authority, moral authority in the right. world yeah becoming a person who people look up to and respect and and uh, and then I got this like serial killer thriller thing going on over here I, I I my expectation is my life has been a series of surprise left turns so who mm. knows mm. my expectation is I'm gonna keep doing both because I love them both. I love the sweet little parables. I love writing those so much. And I also love this this thriller novel, the big novel form. And my wife and I have this Go-Giver marriage book coming out next spring, and we're going to be teaching a, a series of workshops around that and sort of doing that work associated with that book. Hmm. Um, so I can't tell you the titles because I don't know in the books. I don't know, but my, my plan is more Go-Giver books, more Finn thrillers. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you so much, John, for for coming on my show and making this brighter for me. Uh, do you have any last words before you uh, leave uh, from Back to Basics? And before you leave and before you say anything, I want to go and buy the book whenever that is. And I want to get a signed autograph uh, from you, too, on top ah, of that. So excellent. Then, so whenever, right. that, whenever that is, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out offline on that. We will but, figure that out for sure. Okay, any last words you have for Back to Basics? I mean, yeah, sure. I, I think that, you know, we'll kind of go back to where we started in the interview in a sense. Um, it, uh, not all of us are writers. I know this. You know, we all do different kinds of things. We're engineers. We're accountants. We're teachers. We're whatever we do in our lives that we identify with. But the the thing that we have in common is that we're all living unique lives. Uh, a co-author that I worked with many, many years ago said that his said something that inspired me and it's and i've embraced it and made it part of mine too which is that i believe that every single one of us is put on this planet for a distinct purpose that is unique that nobody else has mm. um a friend of mine dan burris that wrote a book with called flash foresight and dan says everyone has multiple talents but one gift and that the most important challenge of your life is discovering what the gift is mm. and then playing to that gift and i and when you when you discover what that and that gift may be something on a world stage like a you know, famous opera singer or it may be on a very personal private stage mm. the only two or three people ever see mm. it doesn't matter mm. whatever your gift is uh when you discover it and you live it then you are a gift to the world yeah. literally yeah Thank you so much, uh, John. And when you come with the, with the you know the sequel and the prequel, please do look us up and please do return back to back to basics. I do want to understand your journey, and and hopefully I'll be part of it, and uh, back to basics will be part of it. So thank you. Excellent. Again. Yeah, it's a date. We'll do it. Thank you again, John, for uh, coming here, and uh, thank you again, and please support my small podcast that I have here. Uh, so thank you again. My pleasure. So we spoke with John today. We talked about writing. We talked about the skills of writing. We talked about the passion of writing. We talked about what is your skill? Not everyone is a writer. Not everyone is an author. But there's one thing that everyone does have is a skill. Tap into your skill, whatever that skill is, and follow that passion. Follow that, that path that you want to go. His passion is that he, he's writing a book. He's writing other books and other books and other books i can just keep on going but that's what he's doing so guys as usual as always there's a quote for the day from back to basics and here's a quote for the day never trust a pretty girl with an ugly secret and that's what he said too everyone's a suspect according to thriller so guys as usual as always keep on supporting me as much as you can comment me good bad ugly either way it'll make my show content amazing there's one thing that which is amazing, which is my content, my guest, and definitely the host. So guys, take care, God bless, and remember, everything in life goes back to basics, and that's what we did today, guys. Guys, take care, God bless, and I will see you next week.
next week's episode on Back to Basics. Are uh, on, on a real basic level, a real fundamental level, which takes me to the, the, the more, what would you say, <laughs> esoteric way of looking at it, which is uh, for me and in my practice, uh, getting really back into the... Um, uh, the spiritual side of life, that uh, that we are uh, tripartite beings, spirit, soul, body, and uh, the spirit is, a, a, I think, is the most neglected aspect of our identity, mm-hmm. uh, fundamentally, and, um, and, and in fact, there was a teacher of mine who would, and, I, and, I, and this was just really recent, so I haven't had...